My name is Gabrielle Gardner. I kept my maiden name as my middle name, so I'm Gabrielle Michelle Gardner. I was born in Breslau, Germany, and I'm now 89 years old and live in Rancho Mirage, California. When I was two years old, we moved to Berlin, Berlin, and we had a wonderful life. My father had a terrific position in an insurance company, and my mother was a very special lady. She was driving when she was 30 years old, although we had a chauffeur because my father didn't drive. But we had a maid, we had a beautiful home, I had a brother, and he and I had everything that we wanted, but we were never spoiled. Our parents were terrific, and they raised us so well, and I appreciate everything that they did for us because they did not spoil us, and that was really great, which I didn't realize until much later. We had very mixed friends, but my parents' friends Many of them, the family, of course, everybody was Jewish, and we kept all the Jewish holidays. But a lot of my father's friends came from the business he was in, and they were not Jewish. And those were actually the people that eventually saved our lives by telling them how bad it's going to be, which we would have never known. And so his associates were not Jewish, and they played cards with them, had dinners with them, but I would say that half of my school friends were Jewish. And it, we really didn't think that much about it, except that we also had religion in school. And when the religious class came up, the Jewish kids went one way and the Christians went the other way. So everybody knew who was Jewish. Well, here's the reason. When you moved from one place to another, you had to register at the police station. And you had to write down what your religion is. And right over here, it says religion Jewish. And we never thought anything about it because no one thought there was any problem putting down your religion. Now, we never felt like strangers. And even when the Jewish kids went to their religious class and the Christian went to theirs, there were no words or anything ugly. It was never a problem with anything. And we went, as I said, we went to the synagogue. Berlin had one of the most beautiful synagogues uh, in Germany. And we went there on holidays. Uh, there was a Jewish area and we went to that special delicatessen and that was a very nice treat for us on Sundays, we went there. But we never had any thinking about who's Jewish and who isn't, and we never heard any anti-Semitic slurs. We used to go to the sea in the summer, mainly just my mother and my brother and I, because my father was at work. And we used to have these huge beach baskets, and there were some swastikas, flags, on top of those beach baskets. And I heard adults whispering and saying, oh, look at this. And then I realized there was something bad. And I found out what it was, that they were Nazis and they were starting to do this. At that time, I was probably about eight. And then as I got older, one day our doorbell rang. and. The maid came and told my mother someone was at the door. And she went to the door and then I looked and I saw these shiny black boots. And I heard my mother's voice was kind of quivering and she called me and she said, did you and Ernie do something on the street? I said, yes, we played hopscotch. So it was a as, as officer and he said, Jews don't have a right to make any marks on the street and don't ever do that again. And he left, but it left us shaking. And that was the first time we felt the fear of things that were changing. We could look out the window 
and saw Nazis marching. And the song they were singing was called the Horst Wessel song. He was their hero. And part of it, part of the song said, we're not gonna be happy until the Jewish blood squirts from our knives. And that, of course, is a very frightening thing to hear. And I had just started a junior high school, and it was very close to our home. And that first semester, we had to sit on Jew benches. And there were probably about six of us out of a class of 25. And they were singing the song, the horse whistle song, and we, of course, didn't. So it became very uncomfortable for us to be in school. And that was really the beginning of all the things that I remember. Well, we were so young then that our friends were not as close as they became later on when we moved to Prague because we were not teenagers. You don't really have those kind of friends when you are not a teenager yet. So there really wasn't that much of a difference. But I felt it in our home because my father would come home and he would talk to my mother about what he heard. And the, the expression was, heads are gonna roll. And it was a very frightening thing to hear. And all his non-Jewish associates told him, leave if you can. So we were very fortunate that he had these friends who cared that much about him. And then he found out that they, they were opening up a branch of this insurance company in Prague and in Paris. So my parents, this was 1933 in, in the spring, my parents went to both places and they came back and they decided that Prague would be better because they could get by speaking German, where in Paris you had to speak French and they decided to move to Prague. Of course, you can't do that overnight. And my father's brother, one of his brothers, had a summer home by lake. And that uh, summer vacation, my brother and I spent at his house while my parents got everything ready for the move. And we never went back to school in the fall. Uh, my father's brothers did not think it was going to be that bad, which a lot of people thought, well, this is really going to pass over. It can't be that people are going to believe that this man is really going to change things and do things. But my parents were extremely bright. They were very worldly, and they really listened to what the associates were saying. And since my father had this opportunity, it really was a wonderful thing that he could do this because not everybody had that opportunity. And I think the most difficult thing was leaving our dog. And it, but we were really looking forward to it. We, we were, my brother and I were, my brother was two and a half years older and we were teenagers by then and really looking forward to something a little different. And so we, in the fall of 1933, we moved to Prague. My father immediately enjoyed being the boss in that office there at a beautiful, a beautiful building on the main street in Prague. Prague was an absolutely beautiful city. And we went to a school that was bilingual. So we found other young people who had come from Germany. And some that didn't and some that did, but we both made friends very quickly. And I was so fortunate that my brother was two and a half years older and some of his friends became my boyfriends. So that was a lot of fun. And we had really good times. Most of the people that were there were well off because if you were poor, you couldn't have made that move. So we were all pretty well off financially. We, as I said, we were never spoiled, but it was really a very nice life. 
My mother went to the coffee house every afternoon and then came back with my father. We had a lovely, lovely apartment, and it was uh, the Czech people were wonderful. They were very kind people. None whatsoever, but we heard terrible stories about what was happening in Germany. And in 1936, the Olympics were in Germany. And my mother had a maiden aunt whom she adored, and she was very brave to go back and try to convince this aunt to come stay with us. And she wouldn't come because she had a pension, government pension, and she thought she would be a burden to us. And my mother came back and she said, I really think we should leave Europe. I think people in general are complacent, and to make a change in your life is very, very difficult. And I, I think that most people really could not realize that something would be so horrible because different stories were heard. I think everybody knew what was going on but they closed their eyes to it. They wanted to go on with their lives. And Hitler kept promising that things were going to get better. And there were being very little unemployment. And he had very different ways of doing these numbers, working with these numbers, making people believe that things were getting better. And they really weren't. And, but most people really are very afraid to make a change in their lives. And so they go to bed at night, oh, we'll get up tomorrow and it's going to be better. And they just didn't understand. My mother came back from Germany. She had gone there during the Olympics and she saw, although Hitler was hiding a lot of things for the general world not to find out what was going on, she talked to her aunt and other people, and they said, it's not going to get better. So my mother said when she came back, let's leave the country. But of course you couldn't leave. You had to have a visa and somebody helping you. So this was a tremendous process for us to try and do this. And uh, I had two boyfriends, and when we were ready to leave, they let us, they, oh, before all this happened, there was Sudeten Germany. I don't know if everybody knows about this, but Hitler said, whatever language is spoken in a country, that's the country. And the, because most people in Sudeten Germany, which was part of Czechoslovakia, spoke German. So he said he wanted to take it over. And that's when this whole thing started with Chamberlain, and they wanted to give Sudeten Germany to Hitler, thinking that that would keep him away and that would keep peace. I don't know if you remember that Chamberlain said, peace in our time, okay? And that was such a terrible thing to happen. And the people from Sudeten Germany came into Prague, they had nowhere to stay, and we had a family living with us Everybody helped these people because they'd know where to be. And that's when one of my boyfriend's parents, they had a villa with 20 rooms, and they offered us to come and stay there. And that was, they were already talking about bombing, planes coming over, and because we had planned to leave, they didn't give us any gas masks, but they told us to have vinegar in the house and if anything happens, to be sure and put the rag with vinegar. And of course, the fear penetrated at everything. Everybody was getting very fearful and uneasy, and it did not make for a very, very happy home life. We're waiting to hear whether we got a visa every day. My father had a niece in Los Angeles. Her husband was a doctor. And they even wrote to us that he was friends with a councilman and he would help him because he's his patient. 
And then his niece's sister, who lived in Hamburg, decided to also leave. So there wasn't enough money for all of us because you needed someone to vouch for you because we were not allowed to take welfare. We probably wouldn't have taken it anyway, but the American government needed proof that when you come, you cannot have any welfare, which we could understand because it was still a depression. So they didn't really want people to come and get what should be for the American people. So finally, somebody who was a distant cousin and was quite well off gave an additional paper that we could, that he would take care of us because it wasn't just our family of four, it was another family of three. We were all coming at the same time. So we waited anxiously, anxiously, and the only good thing is that we were on, <laughs> the good thing that we were Germans, <laughs> so we could come on a German passport because Polish was completely closed. If you were Polish, you could not get out. So it's a, sort of ironic that being a German helped us at that time. Now we were at the airport in Prague and all of a sudden to the Czechs we were German. So they really searched us thoroughly. Uh, my very close boyfriend and his father were there and we were ready to leave and I spot a newspaper and it says plane shot down from Czechoslovakia to Holland. So the plane prior to ours was shot down and I grabbed the paper and threw it away. I didn't want my parents to see it. I was so protective of my parents because they were just such wonderful people. I couldn't imagine them going through this in the middle of their lives with really having had such a wonderful, easy life and then all of a sudden this was happening. And I knew that my brother and I, we were kids, we'd manage, but I felt so bad for my parents. Anyway, we got to Rotterdam and it was night time, and again we had our German passports, and it wasn't until we explained that we were refugees that the police took us on a police boat to a police station, and we had nowhere to stay, no money, and a very kindly policeman invited us to his home. He said, you can stay at my home overnight until you get your ship in the morning. In the morning we wired for our money, we didn't, my parents did. And they found out that the banks were closed because it was Columbus Day in America and we couldn't get the money. And we saw the Staten Dam sail out of the harbor and we were not on it. My boyfriend, I had two, but this one really liked me and I was really a very, very naive young girl. and. I didn't realize how much he liked me, but he gave me a, dic a diary that he wanted me to write every day. It was leather bound and beautiful. And he wanted me to meet his aunt in New York. And of course, by missing the ship, I never met his aunt and really didn't keep in touch with him as much as I should have. And when I eventually got a job at a dentist, I met my future husband. And by that time, my boyfriend had sent me an engagement ring and he got out with the kinder transport. He was one of the last ones to get out of Prague with the kinder transport because he was actually too old to be able to do that and enlisted in the Amer Czech unit of the American Army and that permitted him to eventually go to school, to MIT, Harvard and all these things. And we met later on in life, his wife and family and my family and we've all been friends all these years but it was a very different life than I might have had. And we never know when we miss a boat what can happen. <laughs> so now the policeman said, you can stay another night. But it was difficult for my parents to not speak Dutch and try to figure out what transportation we were going to have now but they did find a freighter that was leaving the next day. A Norwegian freighter was leaving directly to Los Angeles. It would take one month from Rotterdam to Los Angeles, so we would go directly there. And 
We were very thrilled to be able to do this. There was no doctor on the ship. So we had to go to a doctor and get examined, and he had a sign in his office, and in that it said, this too shall pass. And this somehow became my motto. It gave me courage to see this. And the next day we got on the freighter. There were only 12 people, because the freighter went to America to get lumber and bring it back. So there were only 12 people, and that is why when we got to the Panama Canal, we had to get off and take a train across. And because otherwise they would have had to pay too much without freight for just the 12 passengers. And it was sort of lucky that this happened because I had a terrible toothache and they took me to a dentist, but all he could do was pull my tooth <laughs> because he couldn't do any work on it. There wasn't enough time. The ship was very spartan. My brother and I shared a room and with bunk beds. And on the last day, he slipped and he started limping. He hurt himself, not badly, and he started limping. So when we got to Los Angeles, they would not let him off the ship because they thought that something was wrong with him. They wouldn't let him come with us. And that was a terrific blow to us because we would have had to come back to San Pedro the next day. It was just terrible. But we were so happy to be here. But about a week before we got to Los Angeles, the crew was mainly Norwegian. And they called us to the radio, uh, well, trying to think what it's called, it's a, it's a shortwave. And they said, something terrible happened in Germany. It's called Kristallnacht. And that happened while we were on the ship. And it was very, very overwhelming to hear that, that we were so fortunate to get out when all this horrible stuff was happening there. And then we arrived in Los Angeles and our family picked us up and unfortunately had to go back the next day to get my brother. It was kind of really difficult to leave him behind. And we stayed at different relatives for the next week until we decided how we're going to live and what we're going to do. It was very unbelievable to us that so many people did remain. And one of my father's brothers came to visit us in Prague and he went back. So many people when they were older had a government pension and they just couldn't believe that it ever got that bad. And I've met other refugees since then who didn't get out till the beginning of 1940. And we just couldn't understand how anybody could not have seen how bad it was. So, it, yes, <laughs> the Germans didn't want to see it, but these people were also too complacent to just pick up. But most of all, I have to say we were very lucky that my father had this opportunity because a lot of people did not have an opportunity to have relatives here, to have help. And I know that unfortunately, even after we were here for a while, we heard very nasty things said about the German Jews. And I'm sure you know that even in Israel, they're called yakas and they're not liked that well. That's the expression that the Israeli use for German Jews. I don't know where it came from, but that's what they call them. And I think it was more than anything else that German Jews were more assimilated. And I think by being more assimilated and being more worldly compared to people like Fiddler on the Roof, I think there was a lot of envy within the Jewish community. And that's kind of sad because I sat at a dinner party in New York and this lady said, you German Jews that are coming to you. And she might as well have put the knife in me. At that time, I was being a very, you know, I was young, so I didn't answer. I just got up and went to the bathroom and cried. Today, I would have said to her, I have gone through many things in my life since then, 
and I really don't think you understand that there was absolutely no precedent to what happened in Germany. Nobody had expected it. The Jews were good Jews like any other Jews. We were treated well, and it wouldn't be any different if it had never happened before and it would happen in America today. You would be doing the same thing that the German Jews did because there was absolutely no precedent as to what could happen. When I first came to this country, I noticed how carefree everyone was. And we didn't have that in Europe. We were always looking over our shoulder. People here were laughing out loud in the restaurants, on the street, joking. And since 9-11, we don't have that. And we really have to try and get that spirit back and not argue with right wing, left wing, and all the things that we have today worry about politics, we have to be one country and we have to get the spirit back that we had because otherwise the terrorists will have won. Well, first of all, I want everyone never to forget what had happened. It, so much time has passed and fortunately there's still many of us living who are speaking about this because it can very easily be forgotten. And it just never seems to end because I read two days ago where a school teacher said to the children in class that the Jews are the ones that have all the money. And I was shocked to read that because I really think it's time to keep bringing this up, to keep saying that it's not the Jews, that the Jews were not to blame. It made it very easy for Hitler because it's very easy for people to hate other people because they're jealous, they're envious, and we have to keep talking about this. And the other thing is when I speak to school children, I want them to know that no matter what you go through in life, you can be strong enough to deal with it and be able to keep your honor and keep your strength and make something of yourself. That's my main reason why I'm speaking to these children because I think they can't really grasp the Holocaust. So I just want them to know that if you go through a very difficult time in your life, you can, you can change and you can make it and you can get enough strength to be able to do that.